Welcome back. I'm developer evangelist Kevin Hoyt. In this series, we've been talking about web standards. In this particular episode, I'm going to talk about the file API. And the file API lets you work with files on the client without having to send them to some random piece of server technology uh, to process them and get the data you want and send it back. Rather, you can just process those files locally directly on the client without any of that round tripping involved. Now, the file API is actually really kind of expansive at this point. There's a bunch of classes, and, um, uh, and it can be kind of overwhelming at times, especially since a lot of it happens asynchronously, um, and you might tend to get your different uh, function callbacks uh, kind of mixed up. So my best advice uh, when it comes to the file API is if you're interested in learning more about it is to really kind of get your hands dirty and start trying the various parts and pieces. Of course, I'll walk you through line by line how this looks. Um, but again, the lo there's, there's a lot of opportunities to get lost in the code as you work your way through all those asynchronous callbacks. All right. So the file API, the main ones we'll be looking at are the file, the file reader class. Um, that, let, that lets us actually um, get a reference to a file and read it in. You might be wondering, well, what about writing a file? File writer is a class in one of the proposed specifications, but um, it is not yet complete, and I haven't seen it in any browsers yet as well. Uh, so that one is still uh, in tandem. Uh, I'll show you a little trick um, to get around that, kind of, in the interim. Uh, when we do a selection um, uh, via the browser, there are certain kind of restri security restrictions that we need to keep in mind. So for example, uh, you don't want to be able just to let the browser randomly pick a file on your operating system and start working around with it, for example. That seems like a really bad idea. Um, start deleting files in your system directory and things like that. So what needs to happen is that the user needs to make sure that they've actually authenticated that the, or the browser can, can work with the file or specifically called out that they want the browser to do this. So in this case, the way that happens, um, that one way that happens would be to use the input um, HTML tag with a type of file. And that will let you select a file from the operating system, just like you might generally do if you're going to do an upload um, action. Uh, in this case, however, we're not going to upload that. We're going to capture the events that come off of that, that file selection and then go ahead and get the file reference because there's a file class that we'll be working with that comes back from that file selection. And then we'll go ahead and work with that file to go ahead and read the contents of the file. Uh, you might also choose to do drag and drop. That is another way where the user can specifically say, yes, I want this to happen. So uh, dragging something from the desktop over to the application and dropping it into the window um, would let the file uh, actions then take place as well. So if you wanted to read the file in that way as well, that's also considered a user gesture that's approved uh, for invoking file reading. And again, file writer doesn't quite exist yet. The uh, trick to use for saving file data, since that file writer doesn't already exist, would be window.location.href, essentially tricking the browser uh, into thinking that it is downloading data from a server when in fact the data is actually coming from within the application itself. Uh, I'll show you the specifics of that as we get further into the code. I also think it's interesting that there's um, uh, classes for array buffer, there's a class for blobs. Uh, so you're actually getting into the place now where you can deal with more and more binary data inside the browser, whereas before it was pretty much strictly limited to text, unless you really wanted to get in and start doing some byte shifting. So being able to work with, with binary data is really cool and interesting opportunity. Um, and uh, we'll see an example of that actually uh, as we get to further towards the end of this particular episode. For now, let's go ahead and dive into the code and see this stuff in action. So I have Dreamweaver here, and I've got uh, the uh, markup that represents this application uh, already displayed for us. It's uh, gonna take the form of a, a little panel, a little notepad-ish kind of panel, a place for us to put the text data that we're going to read from the local file. Um, and inside of that, uh, we'll go ahead and have an area, in this case a text area tag will do just fine for letting us display that text. You might choose to use a div and make it editable. All kinds of interesting new things in terms of HTML5 in that respect. Um, 
and then we have two other divs here, and I've, used, I've chosen to use divs um, so I can do some additional layout and styling, uh, but what the first, this first div represents an open button, so you click the open button, and that will let us go ahead and read the file. Now, if you remember, I said that you can't just, uh, the user, you can't just randomly read files off the directory. The user has to specifically stay which, say which one they want, and if you're going to let the user click, that's going to happen via that input. In this case, if you look at the div, what I've actually got going on here is that the input is there, um, and it's of type file, uh, and it's actually mapped to fit the entire space of the enclosing div element, the, uh, and that's done through CSS. But what's also done through CSS is that that input type is uh, actually hidden. Um, so, so the input isn't there, uh, and that's not a visibility hidden, that's an opacity equals zero uh, in the CSS to make that invisible. So at this point, the user sees an open button. They don't see the input on top of it. They, click, they go to click on the button, and the normal button interaction happens as far as their eyes are concerned. But what's actually happening is they're clicking on that input element, and that triggers a, a, a way for us to present, hey, what file you're interested in reading, uh, and present that dialog to them. So a little trick there for you in terms of that. And then I've got another button here um, on the screen, and that's for saving the, the file. Now again, file writer doesn't work yet has been implemented anywhere that I've seen, um, but we have a little trick to work around that. So let's jump into the code here. If we look at the JavaScript, we're going to start off where most of my applications start off, that is the application is loaded, uh, we'll call do load. Now here in do load, I'm going to get a reference to that, um, that input of type equals file that's hidden from the user's view, get a reference to that, and then listen for the on change event. And when the on change event fires, we're going to call do file change. Now, that on that on change event is going to happen when the user is finished selecting a file or potentially files from the dialog that's presented to them. From there, I'll also, uh, I'm just going to reuse, in this case, the file uh, variable. We're going to point it, in this case, to the save button, and we'll listen for an on-click event uh, for that save, and we'll map that to do save click. So we can open the file, and we can save the file, and then I've also put in here drag and drop handlers. I'm not covering drag and drop specific implementation in this particular episode, um, but they're there and they're wired in, so if at some point you manage to, to or have time to, to look through this code, you can go ahead and, uh, and see those events and kind of track down how they happen and work as well. I also do some window resize management so that I can dynamically fit our notepad in the center space of the window regardless of the resolution. So the user's gone ahead and clicked on that uh, input box and has selected a file, that's going to call do file change. Let's go ahead and check out do file change. So do file change says uh, read, which is a general method that I've written for the purposes of this application. Uh, and the reason I've done that uh, as an abstraction is because it can be called from the input click or from the drag and drop. So to reuse that method, I've, put, I've kind of segmented it aside into a read, and we'll pass it the file object that gets read in. Now that file object is going to be a file, a proper file object. It lets you know things like the size of the file, the name of the file, and so on. In this case, we're going to send that off to this read method. So let's go ahead and take a look at the read method up here. The read method is going to get that file. And we'll go ahead and say, hey, if our file reader hasn't been used before, in this case it hasn't, this is our first time we've selected a file, of course that might happen repeatedly throughout the life of the application, um, and never actually going out to the server, which I think is kind of cool. Um, we'll go ahead and use the new file reader, and that's going to let us, that's going to be the object that lets us read in the contents of the file. That's going to fire an event for us called onload, and that means essentially that the file has been accessed from the drive and entirely read into the buffer, and we are now able to do stuff with that data. So at that point, we'll call do reader load, and we've got our uh, since we now we've got our, our file our file reader object instantiated and ready to go. We'll go ahead and say, hey reader, read this as text. Again, I think that is really cool to be able to say read as text. Obviously, the op the uh, there would be other options there, that is what that implies, and of course binary uh, coming to many browsers and when it comes to the file reading API, so that's very neat. Uh, we'll say read as text and we'll pass it the file that was selected by the user. I'm also going to go ahead and display the name of the file on the uh, notepad just so the user knows what file they're editing. You can see here that is actually a named inner HTML and then I got the file object dot file name. 
So again, there are a number of different properties on that file object proper. You can do all kinds of interesting things with it. In this case, we're going to go ahead and read it and put the name of the file in the, uh, in the kind of the title bar of our, of our UI. So we read as text. When the text is finished reading, we'll call do reader load. So let's drop down here to do reader load. And do reader load goes ahead and gets a gets a reference to the uh, text area uh, element that we put into our UI and size to be the area where the text appears for us to edit. And specifically, I'm interested in this dot result, which in this case of text data, it's just a bunch of text data that's inside of the file. And I can go ahead and dump that into the text area. Voila, the user sees the content and is ready then to go ahead and work with it. Now, at some point, they finished editing that text document. They want to save it. They're going to click on that Save button. And if you recall, we had that mapped to a method called, uh, what was it, do save click. So let's go ahead and look at do save click. Now, in this case, we'll see that window.location.href. So here's that little trick for saving. Uh, window.location.href is data. We're going to tell the browser that it has some data coming to it. It is of type application slash x download. So that's the MIME type that tricks the browser into thinking it's going to actually download data. And in this case, that's exactly what it's going to do, but the data is coming from our application, not from a remote server. And then we've got uh, a character uh, set on it. And then we're going to pass the URI encoded or encode URI component data value. So we're going to take the data out of the notes get the value uh, from that text area and encode it in URI, encode it, and send that off to the browser to download the data. The challenge with this, and the only kind of, kind of bummer part about this is you don't get to say what the name of the file is. If you're working with a proper file API, that's one of the things you really would like to do is be able to control what the name of the file is that's going on to the operating system. So you can be very specific about telling your user what to look for um, or that they may be able to choose and specify themselves. In this case, because file writer doesn't exist yet, we're using that workaround to trick the browser into downloading the data. And uh, it goes ahead and handles it as such by reflecting the, um, uh, the download in wherever mechanism, dialog, toolbar, what have you, that it would normally download data from, and by giving it a name more or less automated. Let's take a look at this application in action here. Here's our little notepad, wait for a new file. We've got our text area here, our open and our save. Now again, remember on this open that the input is actually there, it's just not visible to us. So we'll go ahead and click on that. It says, hey, what file do you want to use? Well, let's go ahead in here, we'll go to the file, go to our notepad, we'll select civil disobedience, go ahead and open that, and then the text populates into our text area here. So there we've actually just read that file, again, all locally, never had to send anything to the server. And at some point, we've finished um, working with it. We'll go ahead and click that Save button. And you'll notice I don't get any dialog. I don't get any option to name the file. It just literally pops up down here as Download and is uh, put wherever our default download is. In this case, that's my desktop. I can see it over here on the side. So we'll go ahead and say Download Text just to make it a text file. And if I go ahead and open it with, uh, I don't know, let's go ahead and use TextMate here. And so there we go, we actually can see that we've saved uh, that data as well. Hopefully that'll become a bit more polished as file writer starts to come online. Uh, but for now, we'll use that little uh, download hack and, uh, and that'll work for us. And again, in this case, I've done it for a text, but uh, we can also uh, do byte shifting or work with the binary objects that are starting to emerge. And we could create an image and have the user download an image as well. Um, so all kinds of interesting possibilities there for you to take a look at with the file APIs. I encourage you to play around with them. Again, watch out for all the asynchronous hooks. Those callbacks can get tricky. We've got a lot more to come in this series. Until then, I'll be waiting.